Um, so I'm going to talk about a um, potentially new and ultimately very popular uh, BMP, um, and sort of an ecological engineering kind of uh, practice for attenuating some of the problems associated with stormwater. Um, <clears throat> this is the site in, in this vicinity, North Wales, um, that we did the work on. And this is the, the drainage area, and the practice is located down in the floodplain of the Wissahickon. Um, so you see it's pretty good, pretty good drainage area. Typically when you talk about stormwater BMPs like bioretention facilities, you're talking about a, a one-acre drainage area. And we're talking about, in this instance, at you know, 30 acres. Um, these are the existing conditions. So, you know, a mildly incised channel that's been armored starting at a 24-inch head wall. So this never used to be a stream. This is a stormwater outfall from a residential community. And it has, it has eroded the material along its flow path, transported it down into the Wissahickon. And perhaps as importantly, you see there's, there's woods on either side. Um, historically riparian floodplain woods, probably a pretty nice mosaic of um, mesic to wet woods. And as a result of lowering of that channel incision, you're lowering the local groundwater table, sort of uh, degrading that, that wetland hydrology, um, allowing more nutrients to be metabolized in that old floodplain soil because there's more air for the microbes to do more more work in um, remineralizing those organic nutrients, releasing them, supporting some of the non-native invasive species that we're all worried about. Um, but it's also a very popular trail. This is a, a sewer um, alignment. And over top of that sewer alignment, folks walk. They take their kids out there. Um, you know, it's a, what, a 13 mile um, trail. So. We don't really want to compromise that, but if we can capitalize on it, um, it could be a pretty good thing. But this is, a, this is the bridge over this um, incised channel. So just uh, a little uh, stormwater 101, you know, the, the pre-existing, pre-development hydrograph. Now think about the area under that hydrograph as the, the volume of water or the amount of energy that is being put into the environment. When we change the um, imperviousness, when we increase the imperviousness of the watershed, we're, we're putting this much more water or this much more energy into that same system. And of course, that's work on the stream channel. That's work that we're taking from our, our asphalt, our roofs, our cement, and putting it into a natural system that's um, historically not been protected from those extra energies, that extra water. When we do our typical stormwater management, we drop that peak because we don't want to flood people's houses. But the only way for us to deal with the reality that we are still loading more water is to stretch that period of high flow out. So we're still exporting more energy to the unprotected environment. Um, and there's been a lot of work on what that really um, equals. There's folks out at Berkeley, Matt Condolph, who, who says, you know, first off, if you go back to the pre-colonial um, period, our streams were entirely different. There was not very much surplus material. There was the water and the sediment and the nutrients that were being delivered to our stream system. They were resources that organisms and systems depended upon. So they scarfed those things up and used them. Well, now, it's a, it's a waste product, it's a surplus, and it's transported. And it's transported to the tune of anywhere from 100 to 10,000 pounds per foot per year. So a stream bank is yielding this kind of sediment. And of course there's nutrients associated with every one of those pounds of sediment. Some work that uh, uh, Dorothy Merritts and Bob Walter at Franklin and Marshall, not too far from here, um, in Lancaster County have, have done is if, is if you just do a real simple mass loading, the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that comes out of 1% of the Chesapeake Bay drainage area, 1%, 
is equivalent to about 50% of the nutrient loading for, for that 64,000 square mile drainage area. So what that really tells you is the sediments have a lot of nitrogen and a lot of phosphorus associated with them. Now the reality is that sediment is temporarily stored along the flow path, so it's not like it's all getting out there at once. But that's the potential export. So, you know, I don't know if you recognize many of these streams, but they're, they're in the Mid-Atlantic area. So that's representative of the conditions in Chester County, in Delaware County, in Philadelphia County, in Lancaster, York. You know, we're really talking about, you know, for the most part, I think the median of this would be around 1,500 pounds of sediment per foot of stream channel per year is what, what our stormwater dominated watersheds are yielding. So how can we deal with that? Um, you know, we have to, obviously we have to work on source reduction, working up in the watershed at reducing the amount of water that our buildings, our roads shed. And you heard about that in the first presentation this morning about you know, sort of putting in porous paving, um, bioretention along the flow path, opportunities for infiltration. Well, this is the same, same kind of technique, except it's, instead of it being stuck right in a, a development, this is on the fringe. And, and this, uh, this seepage bed that's sort of the, the foundation for this approach, this best management practice, is 80% granular material, 20% uh, organic carbon. Very inexpensive materials on their own. You know, sand and gravel um, comes out. It's, it's a material of lowest possible cost, um, besides, I guess, trash. But, um, and then the, the wood chips, just shredded trees. Uh, we're really looking for the, for the um, refractory wood, not, not the shredded leaves, not compost not something that's been aged and shredded to a real fine particle. Things about the size of your hand to a couple of square inches. Um, if you, you make this kind of a bed, now you're, you're taking two uh, inexpensive and simple materials, you're putting them together and wetting them, and then you have the development of um, bacterial populations, fungal populations, uh, soil invertebrates that are using this now as habitat. They're cruising through this media, eating the fungal hyphae, eating each other, grazing on the bacteria and the other films, maintaining the porosity of this filter media. And um, I'll talk a little bit later on about some of the benefits that that has in terms of nutrient removal. But the real big benefit is we're able to attenuate those peak stormwater discharges like you saw in the hydrograph. We're able to bring that down and there's losses whether it's this hyperreic flow, which never gives up as much water as goes into it because those particulate granules in the wood absorbs water and doesn't release it, field capacity. In a clay soil, field capacity is about 50% of the volume. In a sandy material, you're more down around 10%. But, so you're retaining a certain amount of that water that you use that passes through here that it never really escapes. Um, and then you're also losing it through infiltration into the parent soil, through evaporation, through transpiration. So you're actually reducing the volume of water, which is critical. That's the same benefit that we have working up in the shed with source reduction, we're getting along the flow path. The application that I'm talking about today really doesn't have a stream, but, um, but in this, in the context, it would be, it'd be coming from here to here. This would act as like a low head dam. Now in this application, and you'll see the plans, in this low head dam, imagine this comes into the stream, there's a grade control. There's a riffle structure that we put in there to allow the water to impound, but when the water gets up to a certain extent, it, it flows through. That's a natural structure in a forest. I've seen those, I've seen those in forests, so, right, capture water like that. You hold it uh, and let it go. And, and that's, that's sort of, uh, you know, what we hope this will end up um, resembling. So, um, I don't know, anybody familiar with this model? This is, uh, this is a stream functional valuation model. You know, a lot of the regulators are saying, people are doing all kinds of things out in the natural world, 
And we want to make sure that they're not just spending money and in some cases causing more harm than good. We want to make sure that there's a functional uplift. When you do something out here in the natural environment, we want to make sure that it's better when you're done rather than you just screwed it up and made it worse. So, so if you look at this, this is a system that's been funded by the EPA and the Fish and Wildlife Service and developed by a private, uh, a private group down in uh, North Carolina. But the, the, the beauty and the logic behind this is you start at the foundation, the fundamental for restoration is you have to modify the hydrology. If you don't modify the hydrology, you can't expect any benefits to the biology because the biology is dependent on the water chemistry, which is dependent on channel morphology, which is dependent on the hydrology and the hydraulics. So if you don't fix the hydrology, you're not doing anything for water quality, you're not doing anything for biology. So, so this approach that we're talking about is really has a fundamental benefit right here at the hydrologic and the hydraulic um, level. So this is a, a photograph of one of those sand seepage beds being constructed. Basically, it's a, a mixture, 80-20 by volume, of sand and shredded hardwood. Um, this is the site on the Wissahickon, the constructed site. You can see this. This is that sand bed. So it's not necessarily this, uh, you know, this big five-foot high dam. It's a pretty low profile, pretty wide system. And this is the vicinity. I mean, you can almost see the bridge. I don't know. It doesn't work that way, does it? In plan view. <clears throat> you know, if it was only like an iPad, we could just zoom right in on that and pull it right back down. But it's not that smart, I guess. Um, so where I, where I was trying to expand was this bridge. So I was just showing you that in that photograph, that was the feature. So, so this is the Wissahickon. Here's the uh, head wall, outfall. And then this is that sand bed that we placed on, the, on grade over top of an existing sewer easement. So it's not like we're going in, you know, cutting down trees to put this kind of thing in there. Although, you know, the LOD is always a little bit wider than we'd like it to be. So there's some, some tree impact. Um, so when we have a storm event, the water comes down. This grade control structure has, has roughness to it, so it's not easy for the water to get through it. Or, and the only way it can get over top of it is by having the stage increase. So because of the increased roughness of water flowing through this boulder structure, it backs up into this forested area. And you know, the different colors here just replicate different size storms. And it's, it's just illustrative to give you the idea that that small storms would have a fairly small wetting effect and large storms would have a bigger wetting effect. And then once the stage rises, the water is just flowing right back out, right into the Wissahickon. So it's not like you have to have a, a, a flow splitter like you would if you were doing some kind of a bioretention. Uh, you said this is sitting over an existing sewer? Yes, an existing sewer line. Which so it might get destroyed when they come through. Yeah, it. yeah, it, it could, they could, if they had to do maintenance in this area, they could tear it up. But the beauty is, it's pretty, pretty low tech. It's not like you got to worry about um, meander geometry and, and, you know, certain kind of really um, highly engineered layout. It's, it's basically an A-type berm, which any operator can build without even a set of plans. If you say, this is an A-type berm, it tells them something about the height and the width, the footprint of the berm. So this, is, this was the plan um, that's been colorized. But. So just to go back to some of the benefits now, this facility is sized to provide um, treatment for storms up to and including the one and a half year precipitation event. So this is something I borrowed from um, the Philadelphia Water Department. But if you look at that, that represents 75% of the annual precipitation events in the Philadelphia metropolitan area. So this treatment system is providing treatment to 75% of the precipitation events on an annual basis. So that's really pretty good. Because if you were just looking at um, 
you know, many other structures, they would, they wouldn't be going, they'd be going like a half an inch, maybe an inch tops. And, you know, so that's really a pretty high level of performance. Um, this is after construction, um, immediately after construction. It got a, an inch storm, and that's what it looks like. So you can see, you know, here's the outfall. This is that riffle grade control structure, which is leading to a little bit of impoundment behind it, which is wetting this area. Now, originally this was going to be a little bit longer, run down that trail a little bit further, but there was some bog turtle habitat issues, so it, it had to be shortened. And I guess now those issues have sort of gone away. Um, over time, you know, this area, because, because this sand berm now, the hydrologic regime of that is typically saturated, and so it supports plant material pretty well. As we all know from growing vegetables, sand is a really good growing media as long as it has that moisture. It's very easy for the roots to move through it and tie it up. Um, <clears throat> so this is, we don't have data for, for this North Wales um, seepage system yet. Um, but, but we've got several others installed, yes. Uh, so, uh, so that's, uh, if you get uh, some big storms, they have to build that. It's likely to, to get wrecked, isn't it? And how do you stabilize it long enough for the vegetation to grow in? Well, it, um, I was going to go back, but I guess I don't need to for, for the explanation. There's, there's two things. One, yeah, you're, you're putting in this, this low head berm, which is fairly wide for its height. So it's erosion resistant from the get-go because of mass. But more importantly, you're modifying the energy regime of that channel. If you were placing that material in the path of that, where that incised channel was, you could expect that material to be washed out. But as soon as you raise the invert, now you've got that, that wooded area. So instead of having, say, two or three foot of water, which can do a lot of work, take any of us off of our feet, you're, you're putting water a few inches deep out in that wooded area, and it soaks into that sand berm and wicks. Um, but vegetative establishment is critical. Now, a, a funny story, a, a contractor, the contractor that built this project is a contractor that Biohabitats works with pretty regularly. And they're a good contractor, Meadville. Um, they were doing some work for us in Montgomery County, which was a, a stream project, um, and they had a problem with water flowing subsurface through a part of the, the repaired stream so that the water was, instead of flowing over top of um, riffle grade control structures, it was flowing through them. And they were getting yelled at because the water was supposed to be up on top flowing over top of the riffle. So when they built this, they packed that grade control structure with clay. We had made a commitment, thanks, we had made a commitment that this system would dewater after a fairly short time. We didn't want to give neighbors concerns about uh, mosquito production and, and all those kind of issues. So, so we designed it so that it would be, have positive drainage over a couple of days. And it wasn't happening because they had packed that grade control with clay. So they had to come back in and take it apart and rebuild it without the clay. And um, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that has affected how that one photograph that I showed you looked because this was done late in the year and the plant material didn't really get a chance to um, get as good an establishment period as we'd like. So this is a different site but same approach and what you can see is from from the control stream versus our restored sand seepage system um, the, the blue is the the sand seepage influence and the red is without the sand seepage influence. So you see on these high frequency, low volume storm events, a half inch to a quarter inch, a quarter inch to a half inch, we had no runoff events because all that water was being held and infiltrated or evaporated or stored in shallow depressions. And then when you got to a larger storm event like a half an inch, you would see you'd see a little bit, but not near as much as the untreated watershed. So this is a paired watershed study. 
So, you know, when you start to get up to the big storms, there's no difference because there's so much water coming through, our potential storage volume is sated, and everything else is just passing through. So it's just like the, the untreated drainage network. But on those high frequency, small storm events, you see there's a significant difference. And this is a much smaller system than the one that was done uh, along the Wissahickon. Um, this is uh, the reach that has the sand seepage treatment, the reach above it that doesn't have the sand seepage treatment. You can see the peak discharge is up around 600 liters per second. This is an academic paper, so they don't use cubic feet per second, but 600 liters per second um, with a, a hydrograph with a duration of about two hours where the sand seepage is integrated into the flow path, we've got a maximum, a peak discharge of 20 liters per second. So it's down an order of magnitude plus. And then we've got a, a discharge period of more than a day. And it still hasn't gotten back down to the pre-storm base flow. So what we're talking about doing is, in addition to those losses, there's really this long, long-term storage. So um, a couple of good modifications to the hydrology and the hydraulics, which are sort of the fundamental for any kind of aquatic restoration. What, I just want to go back to the, the part, the area that's, you said the area behind us where the water is coming from is a forested, a forested uh, strip of land, and then it's coming up to the raised berm. And that's storing it and letting it go over a sort of period of time. Yeah. And the water, sh the water coming off of that strip is not enough to take out the, the low berm. Not, not on what if it, what if it's forested, but on a, on a steep slope. And that, I'm curious to know. This is like we're putting a, almost like a rain garden on it at the bottom of the slope. And so, yes. I could see it being washed out if it was on too steep a slope. We, we actually have applications where we do this inside of a stream that's on, you know, 30% slopes. And actually where that little stream would be punching through, that's where the rock is. So that's kind of hardened right there. So that, that takes the brunt of that energy. And it's right, what, what takes the brunt of that, that rock rear that's in the middle yes, of the Yes, okay, gotcha. And then it spreads out to the river. Okay. It's just not a storm, but it's, it's lost its power. Right so you've actually spread the stream out places yeah. where you've taken the stream and spread it out. Mm -hmm. but, but again, let's... So there's, there's no stream except the receiving stream. This is coming out of a pipe. Okay. And it, so it's not water draining from the woods. It's water coming out of a concrete pipe from a residential development. And then we're, instead of just letting it continue to cut down and get into the Wissahickon, for some short period, we're causing it to, to be stored in, in the forest where, where natural resources, surface area to volume ratios can work to our advantage with these kind of effects. So just some more um, demonstrations under, you know, half inch to a little bit better than an inch with the, the dark line being the restored condition and the red line being the condition that doesn't have the sand seepage. You can see a, a pretty marked difference. So there's peak attenuation. Um, there's 60% nitrogen reduction on a two inch storm. 80% um, TSS reduction on the same storm. So, so it, you're getting sediment and nutrient removal as well. Um, and this is sort of a, a natural analog if you think about it. We're putting in this, this semi-porous, low head structure that has a lot of carbon in it. So the bacteria and the fungus in that seepage system, that's a living treatment system now. It's like a you know, a green machine, if you want, um, really works pretty well. So I've, I've got a couple of minutes for a couple of questions. <coughs> Where does the TSS go? The bacteria don't handle that. No, I, so, so part of it is trapped in that sand feature, which is, you know, some people would say, well, that's a problem because that's going to diminish porosity over time, but it's bioturbated because, because it's a living sand bed, not a um, inert sand filter. So, you know, there's 
native plant roots that are going through there. There's invertebrates that are moving through there, grazing on that material, which keep the porosity up. But most of it is being trapped on plant material above the sand berm in that, in that wooded area where it becomes sort of a, like the Nile, a nutrient. It becomes a resource for the biology to use. Yes? I'm on the Planning Commission of the Township, but I got on it in the late 90s. Early 90s, a lot of basins were built. Yeah. And all they were is just earth, earth basins. Can we reapply that? Can we put carbon and sand in there to... Uh, well, we, we just did one, and I actually had a photograph in this presentation, but I took it out because it was a little fuzzy. We, we can retrofit the tension basins so that you actually, they have improved peak attenuation and storage volume, but what happens is, think about, think about having that pond, um, and let's just turn it so we're looking on the profile from the, where the water comes into the pond to where the water goes out of the pond. You can sculpt the pond to have a series of these sand seepage systems in the pond, which all the small storms get handled right up here and, and you lose the water. The bigger storms, they sate that first, they flow into the second one, they flow into the third one. And, and you know, the, the reality is, like Bob said, the way that they flow from one cell or one compartment to the next is through um, a rock grade control structure that's designed to not, not fail with projected shear. So a lot of these get modeled. What would a 100-year discharge through that cross-section do? What's the minimum size particle that we can design that with that won't move under that 100-year queue, under that 100-year discharge? Do we need an engineer like you, or is that something? I'm an ecologist. <laughs> well, are, are we able come to do that with our road crew? I mean, where do you, where do you tap into the nomenclature for this? It's almost like a four bay, right? But it's a huge, it's large. Yes, or, or it's multiple four bays. Yeah, it's sequential, you know? So, so any water that gets into the first one can't get out unless it goes through all of them. Um, you know, I think, I think any, any PE with, you know, a, a pretty, pretty short education can, I mean, this is, this is pretty simple. I mean, we're not trying, it's not, it's not rocket science. You need to be able to account for the change in volume of the basin and stuff. Yeah. Like that. So you need an engineer for that. No, we haven't. Yeah, and, and you, that's something that, people are going to want to make sure that you're not compromising. Is that something we should be looking at, though, uh, since these basins were built years ago? Well, should we be really? I, I, I mean, um, where am I, out of time? You're out of time. I, I have such a good time doing this, but, but I'm happy to talk a little bit afterwards, um, answer the questions. Thank you very much.